we want to continue on with our programming in Python by introducing some of the basic structures for algorithmic programming. These include uh, basically building logic loops. And so I want to walk through how these work and uh, how to construct them in a Jupyter notebook. I, the last lecture I introduced you how to build vectors, matrices, <clears throat> and use the Jupyter notebook. And so I want to be able to now use this architecture to build some very simple logic that would be, uh, can be part of the base structure of building some science computing codes. So this is really about logic, loops, and iterations, and this is going to be uh, some simple ideas, and from these you can build uh, very complex uh, uh, structures. So we're going to start off here. Again, we're going to put our import of NumPy as NP, and all I'm going to do in this first loop is basically start summing some numbers in an iteration scheme. So I'm going to start off with a value of a equals 0. And what I'm going to do in this is do a, a for loop. For loops and if statements are kind of the two major building blocks we want to start to use to build most of our scientific computing infrastructure. So it's really important that you understand how to use for, for loops and if statements. And we're going to start building some of the structure here in this lecture. So, we're going to do a fourth loop, and here the variable is j. This is going to be our counter in the loop for j in range, and here, this is the important part of the logic, 0, 5, colon. So this is the ending of the for loop. So anything below here that's indented is going to be inside of this for loop. And so the for loop is going to take the value of j, it's going to start off with the value of 0, and go all the way up to, counting by 1, because I haven't specified a counter, it goes 0 to 5, very much like the A range variable. And if I don't put any default step, it will just step in, in steps of 1, all the way to 1 less than this final value. So it's going to go from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, five values through this loop. It will not do 5. Okay? And what do I want to have happen in this loop? What I want to have happen in this loop, I'm going to take the value of a, and I'm going to update it. a is equal to a, what it was before, plus j plus 1. So the first time through, a is 0. <laughs> so j is going to be 0 in the loop the first time. So a is 0 in the loop the first time, plus j is 0 in the loop the first time, plus 1. So the value of a is going to be 1 the first time through this loop. Second time through this loop, j is now 1. A is now 1. So A is going to be 1 here, plus this is 1 plus 1, so it's 2, plus this A here, and that's going to be 3. Okay? Then J is going to be 2 the next time around, and A is 3 now. And so you just do this loop, and here are the set of values you produce when you run this code. Here it is. These are the five values. Remember, it goes through the loop five times, not six. In other words, j is never five. j goes all the way up to four. This is just the way that Python indexes. So let me just run this. So you see, shift return, runs it, spits out the answers. OK, let's do a slightly different version of this. This is going to do the same loop, but now in steps of one, you're going to do steps of two. So all we're going to do here is take a zeros again, and we're going to take for j in the, a, in the range, and notice that we're going to do 0, comma, 5, comma, 2. So it's going to take steps of 2 there, just below this 5. So it's going to go 0, 2, 4. That's it. So it's going to go through this loop three times, but now the j it's taking is size 2. And when you do that, below is our values. Run that thing. 1, 4, and 9 are these iterative sums that we're producing when we do this. Okay, so those are very simple loop structures. All you're telling you to do is take a variable and walk through this loop a certain amount of times. The colon is very important at the end of this, so don't ever forget that colon. I mean, you'll just get an error, so it'll be fun when you know that you forgot this colon. But put the colon in. Remember how the count works. You start off, you go all the way up to 1 minus the, the last value in that range. Okay. There are different ways to do this architecture. Let me just show you. Here's another way yet to do this. Let's do the same kind of structure 
from iterating. But now I'm going to say a is 0, and I'm going to make a variable called loop. And loop is going to be a vector. And loop is going to have three numbers in it. 1, 5, 4. And so now I can say for j in loop. Now notice, loop is a full vector, and it's going to walk through every component of that vector. The first time in this loop, j is going to be equal to 1. The second time, j is going to be equal to 5. And the third time, j is equal to 4. OK? So that's how this loop is going to go. You can, in other words, j is not just counting by 1s or by 2s. It is whatever you specify in this vector here. So one possibility is you can just define a, a counting variable above a vector. And then you say for j equals in that vector, whatever it happens to be, and I'll go through this thing. So when I display this now, here are the values it takes on. 1, 6, 10. Okay? So a lot of flexibility about how you build for loops. Four loops walk through its prescribed set of vectors until it's walked through the whole thing, and then it finishes. Okay? And you get to prescribe what values it has to walk through. The simple as that, end it with a colon, everything indented in here is done in that for loop. You can keep pro programming below here, but now you come out of that indent, and then you can start, like for instance, if I were to come out of this thing, and now start doing more math here, I'd want to come out and say, oh, you know, y u is equal to 2. That's not done in the for loop. This is now done outside the for loop. It's going to first do this for loop, and when it's done, it will come out and continue running code. Okay? So the colon tells you that you're in the loop. The indentation tells you where you are. And when we have nested for loops, they get indented again. We won't talk about nested for loops here, but we can talk about nested for loops or nested if statements. And the indentation on each is really critical because it tells you where you are and how they're nested together. All right, let's take that out. All right. What I want to do next is a simple example using a little bit of logic and using these iteration algorithms. I'm going to do what's called a bisection. I'm going to take a function, and I'm going to plot it for you. And then we're going to talk about what we're going to try to do with it. So I'm going to import, since I'm going to be plotting, matplotlib.pyplot equal plt. That's plt. So plt is going to be my base command. So I'm pulling in plotting packages from matplotlib. And what do I want to do? Well, what I want to do is define a variable, a dx, 0.1. So I'm going to define an x value and break it up. And then some function. And I'm going to show you what that function looks like. And I'm going to try to do a root finding exercise with it. So dx is 0.1. <coughs> x is in the NP a range, and this goes from negative 10 to 10 plus dx, dx. So notice what I've done with this by putting this thing going from 10 plus dx in steps of dx. It's going to go from negative 10 to 10 in increments of dx. Starting with negative 10, finishing with negative 10, all the values in between. Okay? And that's what NP A range is. Now y here is going to be a function I define. Now, functions like the exponent, cosine, sine, any special functions, you call them npx, which is the e to the x. np tan is the tangent function. So I'm going to show you what this function looks like. This is the function I've built. It's e to the x minus tangents. Okay? And then I'm going to plot that. And in fact, I'm going to make another plot here, y2 equals 0 times y. So this is just the 0 function. And I'm going to plot xy and xy2 and on some range, and this is the function I want us to look at. Oops. There it is. All right, so this is the function we're looking at at this point. So what you can see here, here's the zero, y equals zero, and you can see there's a bunch of points at which this function crosses zero, okay? And so, by the way, the straight up lines are asymptotes, so they're not actually crossing there. But we're more interested in these spots here where it smoothly goes through zero. And what I'm going to do is try to find, this is a transcendental function, I want to find when it goes through zero. And there's, of course, a, a lot of these points that go through zero. So I'm going to do a bisection. I'm going to look at two, an interval where I know there's a zero in it and try to actually use 
simple logic to go and try to get that value. Okay? Now, this is talked about in the notes in the lecture about how to do bisection. So I, 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 I'm assuming that you might go look at that and say, here's how the bisection works as a theoretical construct. And what we're going to talk about here is the Python code that goes with it. So I'm going to look at the interval right here, negative 2.8 to negative 4. In that interval, it goes through 0. Okay? So let's say that's one, I believe that's one right there. That's that zero right there. Negative 2.8 uh, is on one side of it. Actually, uh, it might, yeah, I think it's this one. Negative 4 is here, negative 2.8 is there. And so it's somewhere in between here. And so I want to try to figure out how can I actually find the exact value down to some precision of where it goes through zero. So first of all, I'm going to say that the right point is negative 2.8, left point is negative 4. And in there, there exists a zero crossing. Okay, so let's go look for it. And we're going to do this through iteration. This is a simple bisection method. So for j in range 0 to 100. So I'm going to make a loop. I'm going to go through this for loop 100 times. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the following question. I know that on the left and on the right, I'm either, you know, if, if I'm above, uh, if you'll see the logic here. So if if on the left I'm above and on the right I'm below, then I know that I've got to, I can, I can, I'm going to look in the middle and see am I above or below, and then decide to change my boundaries accordingly. So this is the way this is going to work. I'm going to look at the middle of these two points, x of r plus x, x of l over 2. In other words, negative 2.8, negative 4, looking at the middle point and ask the following question. Compute fc, which is the value of the function in the middle point. Here it is, n, n p x e to the xc minus tan xc. So that's what this does. So I, I look in the middle, and then I bisect it. I cut it in half, and I ask the question, calculate the value of the function at that point. And at that point, then I want to ask, I have to make some logic decisions. If fc is bigger than 0, so it's above the line, that means my left boundary is going to have to come over, because I know I'm above on this side. So if I'm still above, that means I haven't gone through 0. That means I move this left boundary over to where xc is. So if fc is positive, then the left boundary is xc now. Okay? But if the right boundary, uh, otherwise, and if that doesn't happen, if it's not positive, then I, that means it's below 0. That means I should move my back right boundary over. Okay? So this is kind of how this logic is going to work for us. Right? So if it's above 0, move the left right boundary over. If it's below 0, that means it's, I know the right is below 0, it's still below 0, it means it's to the left of this. So move this over to be the new boundary. So this is how bisection works. You try to say, if I'm above here and here, and it's going smoothly, then if I, my midpoint is still below negative, then I know I can move this over. If it's above positive, I know I can move this boundary over. So that's bisection. So I'm just simply picking which side to move. What am I trying to accomplish? I'm trying to find the point x of c where the value of the function is 0. So what I've done here is I've just given you a little routine to move the boundary. Notice I've used an if statement. So the if logic is telling you to move the left or move the right. Okay. Now, I come down here to an if statement here, and I ask the following question. I'm trying to make this 0. If the absolute value of my function is less than 10 to the minus 5, I should just stop. So I'm going to display the value of xc, the thing I'm trying to find, and break this routine. That's the so when I use this break statement, what I'll do is break out of the for loop. So I keep bisecting until this is satisfied, and I break. And it pops me out of the for loop. And now I have my value here, xc, of when this thing actually goes to 0 at least to five decimal places. So if I run that, there it is. There's your value, negative 3.0964, so far. Okay? So that's a very simple bisection. An equivalent MATLAB code is available also on the website. So you can kind of compare these two things, but they're very similar. They're just very simple logics. For loops, if statements. Most of this class is going to be hanging on 
appropriate construction of how you put coordinate statements together in these loops. And notice what I've done. I've got a for loop on the outside, two if statements. One of them just to tell me how to keep doing bisection, and one of them to tell me when I should stop. Okay? So that is going to be the structure of a lot of logic. And you can often count this ahead of time. How many for loops or if statements do I need to accomplish the task that I want to achieve? And so here's this kind of structure that you have right here. And I think that's it for now. Uh, once you have for loops of statements, then we can build a lot more interesting structures uh, from there.